today. We're in Titus chapter 2. We spent a couple of weeks in Titus chapter 1 looking at who's writing this letter, Paul. Who's he writing to? Titus, which is why the letter's called Titus, or the book of the Bible is called Titus. We've seen a contrast between those in the church community who are leading and serving by example, uh, those who are in a particular role called elder, and those who were also in the church community but were, looked way more like the culture and tried to take people away from the gospel uh, to an anti-gospel or a false gospel. And these were like the anti-elders, people who were exerting their influence in the community, not to serve, but to be served. Not to point people to Jesus, but to point people to themselves. Not to point people to uh, Christ-likeness and embodying the gospel, but to point people to raising their own platform, their own profile, or benefiting their pocket financially. And so we've seen this contrast in the first chapter and Paul saying to Titus, who he introduces as like a son to him, he says, Titus, you're not going to be like the culture around you. You're not going to be like these self-serving people. You're going to be like me, actually, is is basically how he says. Uh, Like father to son, uh, I want you to to be more like me. And and even when Paul says be like me, even in that he's saying, "And, and I'm trying to be like Jesus. So really I'm trying to say be like Jesus. And that's what brings us to the second chapter. And uh, there's this, the first sentence of the second chapter kind of joins in the last where he's given this contrast. Uh, and he says, you're not to be like those anti-elders, the people who have bought into culture and are trying to take the culture of a gospel embodying community and make it just like the culture around them. He says, but, you're not to be like that, but, verse one of chapter two, you are to proclaim things consistent with sound teaching. In the last week we looked at sound teaching, meaning healthy teaching, healthy faith. Older men are to be self-controlled, worthy of respect, sensible and sound in faith, love and endurance. In the same way, older women are to be reverent in behaviour, not slanderers, not slaves to excessive drinking. They are to teach what is good so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands and to love their children, to be self-controlled, pure, workers at home, kind, and in submission to their husbands, so that God's word will not be slandered. In the same way, encourage young men to be self-controlled in everything. Make yourselves an example of good works with integrity and dignity in your teaching. Your message is to be sound beyond reproach, so that any opponent will be ashamed because he doesn't have anything bad to say about us. Slaves are, be, are, to, be, uh, sorry, so, <laughs> slaves are to submit to their masters in everything and to be well-pleasing not talking back or stealing, but demonstrating utter faithfulness so that they may adorn the teaching of God our Saviour in everything. Now, as we read through that scripture, there may be some things in there that you think, that sounds quite controversial, like slaves being utterly faithful to your masters, submitting to them in everything, or even wives submitting to husbands, things like this. And so uh, what we want to do is pray, ask God to help us have understanding because... Uh, his word is good and his ways are good for us. So we want to understand them so that we can live in the joy and the freedom of them. Let's pray together. So Father, again, we want to thank you for these scriptures. Please help us. Where your word uh, rubs against us in a way that is uncomfortable or antagonizing, that help us to... uh, to explore those things in light of your scriptures, in light of your good character, in light of your love towards us, in light of your glory and your majesty, we want to conform to the likeness of Jesus. We want to become more like Jesus. We want to bring you glory with all of our lives. And so help us, like we ask every week, Lord, help us have understanding of your scriptures so we can better live them. So we can take hold of the freedom we have in Jesus, not submit ourselves or become slaves again to the law or to any false gospel that would lead us away from the liberty we have in Jesus, but that we would live life to the full like Jesus has promised. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, you hear last week the setup, the anti-elders, those who teach false things for their own gain. And Paul starts this next thought. He says, but you... So again, he said here, he said, uh, Titus, my son, greetings. How amazing is God? Um, Make sure you're installing 
elders into the church, people who can lead and serve and grow. Watch out for false teachers, anti-elders. Watch out for the false gospels of the culture bleeding or seeping their way into the church. Says, but you are to proclaim things consistent with sound teaching. You are not to be one of those self-seeking, self-serving kind of leaders out for personal gain or to build your platform or to build your portfolio or to make life easier for you. He says, rather, you're not to be like that. He says, rather, you're to be a father like me, is what he says. You're not to be like those out for sinful, selfish gain. Be like me. So teach and live a life putting on display a gospel contrast to the culture around you. And that's basically what he's setting up here. So what does a gospel community look like in contrast to the culture around us? What does it look like for men and women to relate to one another, for older men to relate to younger men, for older women to relate to younger women, for slaves to relate to their masters, or perhaps in a modern day sense, for workers to, how do, how do workers to relate to their bosses? What does it look like? He says, this is what spiritual fathers look like. He spells it out. He says, older men are to be self-controlled, worthy of respect, sensible and sound or healthy in faith, in love and in endurance. Do you know men like this? I think we have many men like this in our church community. It's not an exhaustive list. He's not saying this is all, this is all that it looks like to be a man or a godly man, but he's saying he's addressing some of the lack in the culture around them. So again, what he keeps trying to do is he's holding up culture over here and he's saying, look out! And he's holding up a gospel-embodied community. He says, pursue this. This is what it looks like. This is the contrast. And so right now he's saying, men in your community, uh, especially the older men who need to be exampling and teaching to the younger men, this is what you must look like. Again, not, not an exhaustive list, but he's saying don't draw your ideas about manliness or manhood from culture. Not from first century Crete, not from the medieval times of you know, knights and whatnot, not from the 1800 you know, Victorian English era, not from 1950s America, not from 2023 Australia. Don't draw your ideas of what it means to be a man from culture because those ideas are going to change every generation or change geography to geography. So we don't align ourselves or our ideas of manhood with culture, but rather with what we see in the character and command of God. We don't stick to culture because when culture changes or sways or oscillates or rocks or does whatever it does because it does, if we tether ourselves to culture, we're going to move with the culture and necessarily away from what a gospel community looks like. So he's warning, he starts with the men. He's one of them and says, don't take your cues from culture. Again, Paul's not saying this is all a spiritual father is, but he's saying a spiritual father is at least this in contrast to culture. This is what a man who belongs to Jesus looks like, self-controlled. This is like one big bucket that contains so many other things. Self-controlled with their body, self-controlled with their temper, self-controlled with their finances, self-controlled with their tongue. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. When Paul writes to Timothy and he says, you don't have a spirit of timidity, not a spirit of fear. You have a spirit of love and power or boldness and self-control, self-discipline. That's what the Spirit helps us to do. It should be a contrast in a culture where self-control is, in some respects, considered uh, denying yourself in in a really bad sense. Paul's saying, but a godly man is self-controlled, worthy of respect, sensible, which doesn't mean not fun, 
but it means has sense about him. Sound in faith. It's one who's pursuing Jesus, who is embodying the things we looked at last week. Sound in love, healthy in the way that they are loving. It's necessary for men as individuals and for us as a countercultural community for our men to be known for their love. Strong, sound in love and sound in endurance. Can endure, can withstand a culture that's saying, don't be like that. Can withstand when uh, life gets very busy or very stressful, that we don't waver in our love, that we waver in our faith, don't waver in our self-control. So this is what this is what our men, our mature men, are to look like in the church. What do the fathers teach the sons? He says, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. So saying, old men, mature men, be an example of self-control and then teach younger men self-control. Don't just teach it and not do it. Don't just do it and not teach it. Live a self-controlled life in the power of the Holy Spirit and teach younger men to be self-controlled in everything. Make yourselves, he goes on, an example of good works with integrity and dignity in your teaching. So an example of good works. So when we're going about life, like Jesus said, um, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. So when you're doing your good works, not in order to be seen by others, Jesus warns, but so that God would receive the glory. And Paul's saying also so that those who are less mature than you can see your example and follow your example. Example what it looks like to live a godly life and that you'd have integrity and dignity in your teaching. Your message is to be sound beyond reproach so that any opponent will be ashamed because he does not have anything bad to say about us. So what he's saying here about dignity and integrity means your life matches your words. So saying, preach the gospel to yourself and to others and then live a life congruent with the gospel. So what he's not saying is, preach your life. We do want to preach our life, but only to the degree that our life matches up with the, con- the consistent witness of our conformity to Christ. He's saying, where those two things don't totally align, he's saying, don't like pull back from teaching those things because your life doesn't align, it's like bring it into alignment and then teach, preach your life, preach your example boldly so that nobody can point to you and say, oh, you say this, but you live that. Oh, you say one thing, but you do another thing. <clears throat> you seem really kind of soft on this issue, really harsh on that issue. You say be loving, but I don't see that love. Is basically throwing back to that list from earlier, saying, teach and show younger men how to be like you. It's a big call for us. What we don't like doing in our culture is, on the one hand, we love, as a culture, putting the spotlight on ourselves, uh, personal branding, uh, a carefully curated public persona of what we want to be known as, mediated through social media and you know, the internet and, and whatnot. But on the other hand, we do not like the spotlight on our lives with our backstage stuff, how we uh, pray, the words we use, the, the way our minds think, the way that we treat those closest to us on our worst, the most stressful days, how we spend our money, how much Netflix we watch, all those kinds of things. We don't want a spotlight over there. That's why we have this carefully curated public persona that we project to the world. But what Paul's saying is, I don't know, we actually just, we throw the whole, the whole life open and say, watch me, follow me as I follow Christ. That's what he's saying. Set your eyes on Jesus. Set the parameters for holy living. Teach them and then set an example. 
And as you set an example, you can keep pointing back to your life in the teaching. So saying, this is what it means to be a godly man. This is what it looks like to be a godly man. This is how a godly man speaks to his wife, if he has a wife. This is how a godly man fathers his kids, if he has kids. This is how a godly man relates to his church community. This is how a godly man relates to his vocation or workplace. This is how a godly man relates to the culture around us. As you are living a life congruent with embodying the gospel and pursuing Christ, to say to younger men or less mature men around you, come and look at my life, examine my life. There's a deep level of accountability in this, which is why we don't like doing it. Because we like saying, well, I'll get there one day. We'll get there one day. It's too busy right now for me to work on holiness. One day, absolutely, I aspire to be that kind of man where I say, look at my life. Or we say, well, I haven't, I haven't got there yet. When I'm just like Jesus, then... I'll, I'll show people, that's not, that's not what Paul's saying, man. We need to show, this is how a godly man repents. This is how a godly man goes through suffering. This is how a godly man admits that they're wrong and, and turns away from foolishness when they've been pursuing something foolish. This is how a godly man repents of believing a false gospel that they'd hoped in and comes back into alignment with the true gospel. Keep, keep pointing back to God and his character and command and back to your life embodying the gospel and living out his commands. It's very tough, but it's the thing to which we are called. Consider the writer of Hebrews, he says, <clears throat> um, remember those who spoke the word of God to you, consider the outcome of their way of life, and imitate their faith. And Paul is saying the same thing here but he's saying it to the people who are the ones to be imitated. So for you men, if you are living a life worth imitating, throw open your life to other men and say, let me tell you and show you what it means to be a godly man. And if you consider your way of life to not be uh, worthy of imitation, then pursue being the man worthy of being imitated for yourself. As an example, uh, men, uh, dads, if it's spiritual dads, boys need to see you sing. Even if you think that the, the thing I've heard consistently from men at City Light for 10 years now, we've been around for 10 years, over 10 years, almost 11 years, wow. Uh, from like the first month was at the time young men, now older men with kids, saying, ah, oh, I'm not a singer. I don't sing. Um, and it may be true that they don't have a necessarily pleasant sounding voice, uh, but it doesn't mean that they can't sing. The quality of the voice isn't the thing that determines our singing. It's the holiness, the, the worthiness of God is actually what makes us sing. And so our boys, our younger men, need to see our older men sing. Our younger men need to see our older men repent. Not to sin in public, then repent in private. But even if they, uh, uh, who was it, Spurgeon said, um, someone's repentance should be as, no, as notable or well-known as their sin. And so the, to the degree or to the effect of, you know, the, the, the kind of, Impact of your sin, that should be also uh, the radius of your repentance. Younger men need to see older men repent. Boys need to see men who pray. Can't just be praying in private. We should be praying in private, absolutely. We need to be setting an example for our younger men. Boys need to see men who are strong and providing and protective and men who are soft and gentle and kind. Boys need to see all of these things. Young men need to see all of these things in their more mature men in community. We've got to do it. And if you haven't seen older men do this, or if you are an older man or a more mature man, I want to say that I'm talking like, if we could just draw a line at like 30 maybe, so that you don't think, well, I'm only 
45. Or I'm only 32. I'm still, a, I'm still a boy. No, no. Uh, it's not really about age. It, it is really about maturity. Uh, if you haven't seen that in people, if you haven't had that example to you, we're going to draw a line in the sand and say, well, the next generation, they're going to have great examples. They're going to have great fathers. They're going to have teachers whose lives uh, lived up to, uh, whose lives live up to their teaching. And Paul goes on to say, in the same way, to the women now, in the same way. That's how he starts. You know what I just said to the men? Ditto for the women. In the same way, women are to teach younger women. So in the same way, setting your eyes on Jesus, setting parameters for holy living and teaching them, setting an example. So seeing the character and commands of God in Scripture and saying to young women, see, this is what it means to be a godly woman. Woman, Look at my life. Consider the outcome of my way of life and imitate my faith. Paul's saying in the same way, women, older women, more mature women, spiritual mothers, I'd say the same things, be the same example, live that same congruent life as the older men for the younger men. He goes on to show some of the, some of the uh, contrasts between how the holy women and the women in the culture were living. So he says, our old women are to be reverent in behaviour, not slanderers, not slaves to excessive drinking. They had to teach what is good. So again, you hear these same kinds of echoes of Paul has just uh, said to Timothy to uh, show for the older men or the more mature men. Ditto for the women, reverent in behaviour, not slanderers, not bringing people down, using words to build up, not slaves to excessive drinking, not using their freedom to go back to what, how they were living before, but rather to use their freedom to build up, they're to teach what is good. And what are spiritual mothers teaching their spiritual daughters? What are the older women showing with their lives, exampling with their walk and, and teaching with their words? He says, teach what is good so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, love their children, be self-controlled, pure, workers at home, kind and in submission to their husbands so that God's word will not be slandered. So let's have a look at some of these. Uh, mature women are to teach less mature women what is good? Teach them about God. Te- teach them the things you've learned. And again, you might be thinking, well, I'm only, I'm only 25 or I'm only 50. Or you might be thinking, I- I'm only 65. Or, you know, I- I need to, I'm not there yet. I need, to, I need to wait till I get there. And when I get there, then I can do it. Again, same challenge for the men in the same way. If you're you're not there, open up your life and show the journey of someone who is pursuing Jesus. Not to show someone who's arrived. Paul says, I haven't arrived. And yet he still says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so don't say, well, I'll get there one day. I'll I'll do it one day. Or I'm not there yet and so I can't do it. Rather, say, I'm committing to being the kind of woman who can open up my life and say to younger women, be like me as I pursue Christ. And that way you can show your flaws and your failures and how you repent and how you pursue Jesus in them. You can show how you're jettisoning or abandoning false or foolish gospels and coming into line with the true gospel of Jesus. You can show all of these things in the working. I show you, this is how you do it. This is how you repent. This is how you love. It says, encourage young women to love their husbands and kids. Be self-controlled. Again, makes both lists. Fruit of the Spirit. Be pure. We looked at this last week. What does it look like to be whole, healthy? Be workers at home. Again, I don't think this is, he's not giving an exhaustive list, nor is he saying this is the only thing that women are to do. We'll come back to this in a minute. Be kind and in submission to their husbands. Now we hate the word submission in Australia in 2023. We hate it. Um, we, hate the, we hate the word, I really believe, because we believe the lie from culture that submission is somehow subjugation. 
and in need of liberation. So if you submit to something or someone, then you are somehow... uh, You're in need of freeing. Uh, In a biblical perspective, we see it's actually a better way. We've come out of subjugation to the law and into submission to Christ as a people. And that's, the Bible tells us, that is actually liberty. That is freedom. Submission doesn't mean, in terms of husband and wife uh, marriage, doesn't mean the husband puts his foot down. Submission doesn't mean that he gets to unilaterally decide things. Submission doesn't mean that husbands and wives can't disagree on things. Doesn't mean that uh, wives shouldn't exercise their gifts and leadership. What it means is that we as a community and husbands and wives uh, understand that there is a particular responsibility on a husband before God for his wife and family that the wife doesn't have. There's a particular responsibility. It's not saying that men are generally responsible for women. That's not the case. This is a particular uh, aspect of a particular relationship. So men aren't bosses of women. Husbands aren't bosses of wives. It's not what this is saying at all. It's about a particular relationship in a particular setting. doesn't mean that women can't lead. doesn't mean that women must defer to men. It's not what he's saying at all. Again, we don't want to uh, kind of roll all this into our understanding of submission because then we either reject submission where we should be embracing it and pursuing it or we embrace a faulty, false kind of submission that actually is the kind that you need to be liberated from. So we have to understand what it means by submission. It is a particular relationship in a particular setting and it's a particular responsibility the husband has that the wife doesn't have. For example, it is not said of the wife that if she doesn't provide for the family, she has abandoned the faith, but it does say of the husband if he doesn't provide for his family, he has abandoned the faith. It's a particular responsibility. It doesn't say that a wife failing to honour her husband will have her prayers hindered, but it does say, Peter says, uh, for the husband, his prayers will be hindered when he doesn't honour his wife as a co-heir in the grace of life. Men and women are not interchangeable. Husbands and wives are not interchangeable. Speaking to your husband is recognising that this man will give an account for how he leads his family in a way that none of the rest of the family will give an account. It doesn't make him smarter. It doesn't make a husband more knowledgeable. It doesn't make him wiser. It doesn't make him a better leader. It doesn't take away any agency or personal responsibility for wives either. Submission here is not a worldly subjugation in need of liberation. It's a liberated life with full agency that says, uh, this is yours. It's not taken, it's not demanded, it's given. So we, we submit, Scripture talks about submission to many in different kinds of ways, in different kinds of relationships. So for example, we all submit to the Lordship of Christ. And we say, this is yours, to our everything. That's our, that's our submission to Jesus. We submit to one another, uh, Paul writes to the Ephesian church. We submit to one another in reverence of Christ, where we say here, this is yours, where we belong to one another. We are in some senses beholden to one another. We can't fulfill the law of Christ unless we bear one another's burdens, for example, he tells the Galatians. And so we submit to one another. We have to say, here, this is yours. Uh, We submit to earthly rulers and authority, Paul also writes. So there's an aspect where we say, we have liberty to do whatever we want, but we, we, in our liberty, we say we are not going to behave in certain ways because we are submitting to the earthly authorities that Scripture tells us God has put into place. In a church context, we submit to the elders, including the elders. And here it says, wives, submit to their husbands. Uh, where there's an aspect of saying, here, this, this is yours. I want to caveat all of these submissions to say that we submit to the degree 
that they are leading in Christ. And so when we submit to Jesus, we submit to Jesus fully because he is the Christ. When we submit to earthly rulers, we submit to earthly rulers to the degree that they're operating in their God-given authority. We don't have to submit to earthly authorities where they're operating outside of their God-given authority. So when they say, you must stop preaching the name of Jesus, that is outside of their God-given authority. So we don't submit to them when they're operating outside of their God-given authority. Does that make sense? We don't say this is yours. That's not theirs. We submit to godly elders. We do not submit to ungodly elders. And wives submit to godly husbands to the degree that they lead like Christ. Paul speaks of this in greater depth to the Ephesians where he writes, what's the purpose of marriage? It's to paint a picture. It's actually prophetically put on display to a watching world the relationship that Jesus has with his bride, the church. So it's supposed to be like a little picture of that that we carry around with us. It says, Jesus, the husband, lays down his life for the wife. It says, man, like Christ, in painting this picture for the world of what it looks like, of, of the marriage of Jesus and his bride, uh, men are to lay down their lives for their wives. And that's when he said, and women, submit to your husbands. Oh, sorry, wives, submit to your husbands. We get submission wrong when we forget that we were previously slaves to sin and we've been set free. So we submit in freedom and we, in our freedom we say, this is yours. We do it in our freedom. God doesn't want you to go back into slavery. doesn't want you to go back into subjugation. doesn't want you to go back into sin. That's why Paul is warning Titus, we looked at last week, about all these empty promises that the false gospels and the false teachers and the culture is going to try to preach and proclaim. Saying, don't fall from them. You're free. Operate in your freedom. Jesus doesn't want to take your joy. That's not what submission means. He came to give you his joy, a joy that doesn't fade. He doesn't take away your freedom. He has gifted you freedom. He doesn't come away to make your life worse or give you lesser of a life or to constrain your life. He comes to give you life in the full. And we live life in the full by constraining ourselves with our self-control. He saved you, he's freed you, he has joyed you, not to then take those things away from you, but so that you would have life in your fullness. So don't believe the false gospel that tells you there's salvation in any other name or a better kind of freedom than what Jesus gives. Which is why we say Jesus is not just our saviour, he's our Lord. And we say this is yours, all of us, everything we have is yours. So we don't look to men or women that aren't your spouse to try to fulfil you. Don't look to pursuing vengeance. Don't look to trying to cut up our body to make us more presentable. Or we don't think if we just had more money or more staff or more power. We We don't buy into the culture's false gospels. This is why we need men to show boys how to be men and we need women to show girls how to be women so that we don't outsource this most important work to culture which has no idea what even is a woman or a man. Can't do it. Certainly the culture can't say what is a holy man or a godly man or a holy woman or a godly woman. Culture can't He would tell you, what is a woman or what is a man? There's total confusion on this. We have to, we have to bring order where there's chaos. And that's to live out these words that we read in Titus. That men need to be examples and teachers of younger men and women need to be examples and teachers of younger women. So you want to know what a man is? You want to know what a woman is? Look at me. Let me show you. Let me help you. Spirit tells us, obey God's commands, teach those younger what it means to be a man or a woman and show them. And tell them again as you show them. Son, this is what it means to be a man. Daughter, this is what it means to be a woman. It doesn't mean that men you know, should only teach boys or, uh, or younger men and women should only teach girls or younger women. It's, it's talking about in this particular context, in the context of what does it mean to be a man or what does it mean to be a woman. We'd show them, teach them. 
Again, Paul's instructions, they're not exhaustive or limited. He's not saying this is all that men do. This is all that women do. He's saying, make sure you teach your kids these things. Your biological kids, your spiritual kids. Make sure you're exampling them. Make sure you're pointing them out. Make sure you're teaching them. Otherwise, they'll blend in with the culture around them. And Paul tells us why we should do this. He says, so that God's word won't be slandered. And honouring God at work, he says, so that we may adorn the teaching of God our Saviour in everything. So our teaching and our exampling to those around us keeps God's word from being slandered. No one can speak against it, or at least to the degree they can't say, well, you say one thing, but you're living another thing. And our example adorns the teaching in everything we do. So adorn means to make more beautiful or make more attractive. And so when we teach the gospel, God's character and God's commands, and when we live God's character and God's commands, we are adorning the teaching. Your example makes your words more beautiful. Your life shows more clearly the beauty of the gospel you're proclaiming. We need to live congruent lives that show more clearly the Lordship of Jesus when your life is aligned with the commands of Christ makes our witness more beautiful. We're actually showing Jesus more clearly when we live like this and we're called to live this beautiful way of life. We set our eyes on Jesus. We set the parameters for holy living and teach them and then we set an example for others. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for these sometimes difficult words. But we also want to acknowledge we can't do any of these things without your Holy Spirit. Even with your Holy Spirit, we feel the constant tug and pull of the culture around us to live a way that would not be pleasing to you. So help us, please, Lord, to live lives congruent with your commands in Scripture, congruent with who we see uh, Jesus to be, and step with your Holy Spirit. Help us to be self-controlled. Help us to be the kinds of examples where uh, we can say to others, um, you can imitate me. And where there's a deficit there, Father, help us to uh, step into that deficit, pursue Jesus. Lord, help us to encourage one another, challenge one another to the same end for your name's sake, for your glory, so we can be a consistent and beautiful witness to the world around us. In Jesus' name we ask, amen.